Coming up, a forensic audit of defunct council companies gets the thumbs down from councillors, proposed childcare centre at Deeping Heights not approved, a review of decision-making powers of a key committee, flood buybacks latest, new rural waste transfer station site rejected, and better education needed on the use of sandbags. Mayor Teresa Harding joins the show following the October 27 meeting of Ipswich City Council. It is Thursday, October 27, 2022, and I'm Alan Roebuck. Welcome to Ipswich Today, which acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which it is produced and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. This podcast is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. Thanks for talking with Ipswich today, Mayor Harding. Oh, thank you, Alan, and thank you to listeners. The mayoral minute seeking a forensic audit of the now defunct council-owned companies kicked off the meeting. In your opening remarks, you said there was one more thing to be done. Uh, the truth about previous councils' finances. Is there something specific within those companies you're targeting? When I say one more thing, I, I made the election commitment to open the books and do a full forensic audit. Now, I've opened the books. Uh, we did that back in July 2020. And then uh, in March 2021, the Queensland Information Commissioner actually then told us that we couldn't publish all the information that we wanted to on the councillor expenses or the controlled entities. And that kind of knocked us for six. We just thought that we could publish it and it'll you know, be left up to the community and they could read it. It might be a headline for a couple of weeks that, that we could move on. So I guess for for me, there's certainly the, the one last thing was that full forensic audit. So, you know, and, and we've seen with recent media investigations that there are more and more questions over the financial practice of the previous councils and how those council owned entities spent rate pays money. Um, I suspect that there'll be more media stories to come and they just keep coming out bit by bit, Alan. Um, it's just, I think, embarrassing for us, but I think the people of Ipswich actually deserve the truth. So I think the only way is a is a, an independent audit uh, that will be conducted at arm's length to give rate pays in our community the answers that they deserve. While there was a lot of discussion at the meeting, it was tense but polite. Uh, mm. You were the lone voice to support the audit. Where to from here? Yeah, look, I spoke with the um, Auditor General, um, Brendan Worrell, last week and informed me that um, any elected representative can write to him and request an audit and he will publish that, that, that request online. So I've written to him this afternoon and re- requested an audit. And um, so that's, that's my step. So I respect the view of the council and I think it was a very respectful and professional discussion. Um, but yeah, any elected representative can write to the Auditor General and, and request that audit. And I want to stress the fact that it is an audit that's not at, at council expense, um, um, that this was a request for an audit to be done at the state government's expense. Can we go back to before 2020 when the figure of $78 million was uh, uh, bandied about by the administrator, uh, Mr Chamello? Now, that was a, uh, a $78 million loss on paper, i.e. the value of the properties at that time. I don't believe there's any inference that money was stolen, but it may have been misspent. Do you think council's going to get that money back in due course when the properties are sold? Ultimately, Alan, Alan, there was never a, f- a forensic audit done of the controlled entities. And, and even uh, um, Councillor Dahl, who spoke against this, um, she admitted there's been no forensic audit of those controlled entities. They were set up to be controlled entities. So the Triple C said they, they couldn't, you know, audit them. And then uh, the ASIC also said they couldn't audit them because they were controlled entities. So they've actually never been audited. And I think that was the, to me, the, the very interesting part. And and with the right to information requests that have come from media, and there is more to come, um, it ke- just keeps showing that there are things there that, you know, the residents aren't aware of. And, and I think the people deserve the truth. Let's lance the boil. Let's stop this drip feed. Let's lance the boil. Get the truth out there so we can actually move on. Because, you know, we are we are a wonderful community. Uh, I think we feel very done and duped. And I think we really want the truth to come out and that way we can move on. Well, one last word on the council-owned companies. What do you say to your critics who call for you to move on and just let it go? Leave it in the past. <laughs> My intention was always to is always to move on, and when we did that mayoral motion at our very first council meeting, we said we wanted it all published on the first of July, twenty twenty. Uh, like I said, we would then have 
it would be a few headlines and we could move on. I, I never for a million years thought that the Queensland Information Commissioner would block us uh, into doing that and, and ask us for the most risk-averse approach, which is seeking uh, the councillor's written permission to publish the information. And to date, only one council, dismissed councillor has done that. The rest have all refused. Let's move on to other items in the meeting then. Yes. Carmichael's Road, which was uh, being pushed for an upgrade by Councillor Island. It's the dirt road that leads into Harding's Paddock. Do you think council should be getting bogged down about debating such issues when there are fewer than 30 vehicles a day, roughly, using the road? Um, Alan, I truly believe that every single councillor should have every option to put forward whatever notice and motion that they want. It's part of their democratic right. Um, Council Island feels very passionately about uh, Harding's Paddock. It's been, had a great upgrade um, and it is a gravel road and it only has between 28 and 43 cars a day. So, look, it'll be obviously some cost if it was upgraded. Um, the council recommended doing some more safety um, improvements there. But, look, that's that's Council Island's prerogative to bring that up as part of our budget discussions which start next month. Can't council just do something already? Isn't there a policy on maintaining dirt roads? Look, we have a six-monthly inspection uh, schedule, but again, it comes down to priority and there's only so much money and we're probably going to give a priority to a road that's more heavily used than one that's got 30 cars a day at this stage. On to the tabling of the report from the uh, Growth Infrastructure and Waste Committee, specifically item two, that's the proposed childcare centre at Deebing Heights, in the area of the former Deebing Creek mission. Now, officers recommended it be approved. Councillors did not support it at the committee meeting and the sites in the Ripley Valley Priority Development Area, unlike other areas in Ipswich, this has to be notified to the state. Sorry for such a long-winded question, <laughs> but what happens next? Yes, we are, we're blessed with three, three planning schemes in our council, but usually each council only has one. We have the Springfield Land Act as well as the Ripley Valley Priority Development Area, or PDA. Yes, so we don't have that ability to refuse. We have to uh, go through the state government. Um, there were significant issues raised by the community about the cultural heritage matters. Uh, they are matters that we as a council don't get to decide on. And whilst there was some information about uh, police officers have received advice in regards to um, those bones and the remains, um, the advice from the police was that they were uh, pig and animal remains. They weren't human remains. Unfortunately, in the in the report, we actually didn't get to see that. We, we got all we got told was uh, what happened in that phone conversation. So, look, we've we've we're representing our community. We've gone back to the state government asking them for some more information. And at this stage, we've indicated our indication to uh, refuse that based on on cultural heritage matters. The Governance and Transparency Report in Item 2 is looking at redefining the decision-making powers of the Growth Infrastructure and Waste Committee. You're limiting it to just items under the Planning Act. Can we go back to July mm -hmm. 2020? Why did Council think it was a good idea to give one committee decision-making mm. powers traditionally reserved for council meetings? We are the fastest growing city in Queensland. Um, the advice we had from our planning area was that having a monthly meeting to decide this uh, would not be good for developers or mums and dads who are wanting to, you know, get applications through. So we made the decision that we would ha give, you know, that delegation to the Growth Infrastructure and Waste Committee. That way we had two committees a month that could deal with those planning matters. What I have found over time, this is why I actually pushed for this, but what I found over time, we were actually getting a number of matters that hadn't gone through the subcommittees in my view, being pushed through to the Growth Infrastructure and Waste Committee. my I, I strongly believe in democracy and having our two-step process that it should go through the committee and the full ordinary council. So, um, and council was in agreement that we would make sure we'd only look at planning matters in that particular committee. Uh, last time we spoke, Mayor Harding, we were discussing the Resilient Homes Fund and the buyback program for houses. So, how are the buybacks progressing? Um, I think it's going well. You would have realised we're also dealing with, working with families that are quite traumatised. It's, it's a big thing. They've been through a massive trauma earlier this year and now looking at uh, moving and buying a house. So that's 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 busy enough for any at any time but after this. So I think um, at the moment the Queensland Reconstruction Authority have made 32 offers uh, to people um, in Goodna and 26 are accepted and of these 21 have been finalised by the Queensland Reconstruction Authority and all 21 contracts have been issued to sellers to sign and so far we had 10 returned. Um, I've got more of the data if you want, so, Alan. So does that mean 10 people have settled already and will get their money? Yes. Yeah, so of these 10, seven mm. have been fully executed with first settlements to start next month. So four properties will settle on the 14th of November, one on the 5th of December, one on the 2nd of De – sorry, the 12th of December and one on the 16th of January. So we're expecting more to come through as about 70 other properties as part of Trench 3 will go out to, to other Ipswich residents. From where I sit, that sounds like uh, 
tremendously good news for those uh, flood affected families. It has. All three levels of government have worked really hard together and the residents have been wonderful as well. And I think the fact that people are getting paid pre-flood valuations is, is a, big, a good step as well. Let's talk about council divisions, the division mm. boundaries and the multi-member representation of which Ipswich is the only one in Queensland like this, but there are others interstate, of course. Council's submission to the Change Commission makes for interesting reading, the main thrust being a return to the previous arrangement of 10 divisions, one councillor per division. Which one do you favour? Uh, I guess I'd go back to the fact that um, in 2019, when the Change Commission came forward with the idea of four divisions and two councils per each division, in there there was a requirement for a mid-term review. So last year we did write to the Change Commission saying, hey, we'd like to participate in this. Uh, you can see that online we've put our, you know, openly we've put our, our suggestions forward. We've, we've suggested either uh, five divisions with two councillors each or going back to the 10, council, 10 divisions with one councillor each. We certainly found when we compared um, the number of councillors um, to be compared with other uh, similar size cities that Ipswich residents were underrepresented more than any other area. And we're the fastest growing you know, council in Queensland. We really think it's important for all the residents of Ipswich to be represented well. And at the moment, the ratio of residents to councillors is, is we're the most underrepresented group in, in similar sized councils. Uh, Queensland, of course, also has undivided councils. Did any of the councillors and yourself consider moving down that path? Look, we just discuss it. I guess this is a big, big um, area, and I listened to um, Division One, um, which is, goes from you know Red Bank Plains through to Grandchester. It's, it's a lot of uh, areas to cover, and I think in those times, often the more populous areas get a, a higher look in than so those areas that, that aren't as well populated. So there was certainly a, a consensus amongst councils that we should have a divided council of some sort. When reviews of this type are underway, it's really important that uh, residents have their say, and they will get that mm. opportunity between the 14th and 28th of November. It's only about basically a two-week window. Do you mm. think there'll be much of a response? Look, I'd love to. Um, when this happened la uh, last time, we only had 1,049 residents put forward submissions. It would be great to get more than that. Um, letting know this is an independent process. It's been run by the Queensland Government, and I really encourage people to put their views forward if they don't have a suggestion on solution, uh, but at least put their views forward. There'll be a number of questions put there by the Change Commission. Um, you know, our council will be shaped by what the community say, so it'd be really great to get their feedback. A new waste transfer station site proposed between uh, Rosewood and Grandchester has been given the big thumbs down by councillors, mm. especially after uh, watching uh, the council meeting on YouTube. What was the main reason it was rejected? When it first came to us, I think it might have been April or May, we had concerns immediately because of the road. It's a 100-kilometre road. It's at the top of a, sort of a crest of a hill at a curve. It did seem like a safe area. So a number of the councils went out that afternoon just to double-check. And so we did highlight it to the council that we thought that site wasn't a good site. Um, unfortunately, the council had already engaged a consultant to progress through an evaluation of about five or six sites. We were also on a tight time frame. The state government had given us um, a grant for this and we had to get it done by a certain amount of time. So, look, the, the evaluation came back that particular site was um, rated number one. We've listened to the community. We've had two community sessions in, at the Rosewood Library. And so for the council to no longer consider any further, we've moved this notice of motion to remove it from the from the uh, basket. At the end of the meeting, there was uh, a notice of motion from Councillor Nicole Jonick regarding hmm. sandbags and community consultation. The meeting was paused after Councillor Jonick got somewhat emotional, and I really get it. I really understand why she got yeah. emotional after being affected by the floods in 2011 myself. You, you would have these yeah. instances where it was discussed and you just couldn't help yourself. So she doesn't have to apologise to anyone. I think we all understand. Yeah. But, but the main, main thrust in her argument is, I think, better education. So what is Council going to do from here? Yeah, so the notice of motion was voted on. And, and I'd like to acknowledge that, you know, Nicole and her family were flooded out in 2011 and obviously 13 came close. And even just this year, um, you know, she spent a lot of time with residents who were flooded and that's, that's um, that weighs on you as well. She does feel for her residents. The main thing is that it has to be better education. Um, Council have updated their um, sandbag information on, on website this this week actually um, but we're very keen to make sure that all our messaging is consistent with the state QFAs and SES uh, do have great videos great tutorials great pamphlets and it's really important that we have that consistency across our state and uh, how we respond to these things and if I can just uh, have a little opinion here Mia Harding mm. uh, sandbags are I think they're overrated in terms of what they can do they have a limited role 
But uh, I think the community more broadly gets just a little emotional and carried away when it rains because uh, most of those sandbags will end up as topsoil and not do anything. We saw after 2011, mm. the feedback in the flood reviews was very much, a lot of residents were quite upset that they spent so much time sandbagging. They wish they spent the time moving their furniture Correct. to their second floor or Correct. to another location. And it's important to have that discussion. And I also saw, you know, this weekend with the rain, the calls came for sandbags immediately when there was, you know, <laughs> yes. uh, no flood alert or anything like that. So there's a, a heightened level of sensitivity in our community and it's really important to be aware of that. So we did let um, sandbags be collected much earlier than we probably would have and we ended up over the weekend about 2,500 were collected at our three different um, locations around mm. the city. Mayor Hardy, on that note, we'll leave it there till next month. Thanks again for speaking with Ipswich today. Thank you and thank you to your listeners. A reminder to look for handy links in the show notes, including to Council's meeting minutes, agendas and YouTube channel, where you can watch meetings live and on demand. Ipswich Today is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. This podcast is also listener-supported. Please make a once-only gift or regular donation to help keep it online. Just go to ipswichtoday.com.au and click the donate button on the home page to make a payment through PayPal. Follow and stream this podcast from your favourite app, including iHeartRadio and Amazon Music, or play Ipswich Today on smart speakers. Music is supplied by Purple Planet Music. This is Alan Roebuck. Thank you for listening. <laughs>